So the EV revolution is here and gathering pace whether you like it or not and with it comes a bunch of questions such as if EVs use coal powered electricity will they be worse for the environment? Briefly the answer is no. Would, the, would we overload the grid if everybody bought an EV? No, I've got another video explaining that. Another question is, the battery needs constant replacement? Well, no, it doesn't. They last many years, retain their charge. And the question we're going to discuss today is how good a day for four-wheel driving and towing? Okay, so here is the question. Are electric vehicles any good for long-range towing and four-wheel driving? So let's start off with why they're great for both purposes. The first one is there's lots and lots of power, lots and lots of torque. And then the second one is storage space, surprisingly. If you're going traveling, you want a lot of storage space in your vehicle and EVs, because they don't have a large ICE motor, um, actually have a lot more storage space than the equivalent ICE vehicle. They're more reliable because they are simpler, there's simply less moving parts to go wrong and less maintenance. You get fantastic speed control with regeneration, which is a bonus for on and off-road use. The weight is low and central. Now this is a negative for off-road driving, you want things to be as light as you can, but for towing it's actually a positive. You want a nice heavy vehicle, and the fact the weight is low and central is a bonus for trailer dynamics. Uh, individual wheel drive, the ability for vehicles just to drive each individual wheel, that will have a completely new dimension of car control and dynamics and ability, and I've got another video explaining that. Torque control, there's going to be a lot of torque instantly available, pretty much like speed control, and they're going to be quieter, which has to be a bonus when you're off-roading as well. But there is the question we've got to discuss, and that is range. And let me make it clear, range is not a problem for EVs for city and suburban driving. You come home, you plug it in, you drive around all day, plug it in again when you get home, not a problem. Um, it's just range anxiety is not a, not a thing. But it is a problem for towing and off-road for longer distances, and that's what I want to get into in this video, how and why that is. And yeah, what I'm talking about here is a small percentage of the population. The average Australian mileage is 16,000, probably not even that in some states. Um, I personally do more than that in just my daily driver and a lot of the people that follow me will do a lot more. Those are the people we're talking about here, not the average Australian. Okay, so let's start off. We'll take a look at the F-150 extended range and the F-150 diesel because that's a popular um, pickup slash ute and um, there's a diesel and electric version of it. So the range officially is 483 kilometres from the WLTP and the range of the diesels um, is 1,000. Now I've got that simply by taking its 24 mpg, 98 litre tank, dividing it on by the other and that comes up with a range of 1,000. So you can see there straight away we get um, about twice as much range on the diesel and it's also 850 kilograms lighter as well. So that's the first issue. So basically EV four-wheel four drives have a shorter range than diesel and range is everything when you're going long distance touring and when you are towing. It's really, really important. Okay, so let's take a look at why that is the case. Now, diesel and electricity can be thought of as sources of energy for propulsion. Then if we look at the commonly accepted figures, we can see that the energy of one litre of diesel is about equivalent to 10 kilowatt hours um, of battery power. Now we know that a litre of diesel weighs about 0.85 kilograms, but how heavy is a battery um, for a given kilowatt hour? Well, we don't know. What we can do, take a look at some stats. We'll take a look at the Lightning standard range and extended range. That's a 98 kilowatt hour battery, weight 2799, 131 kilowatt hour battery, heavier and we add 190 kilograms, 33 kilowatt hours, and we come out to about 5.8. Now, there's, that's not an exact calculation. It is rough, but it does bear out. If we look at the high-end Icona, the standard and extended range, we come up to around 6 kilograms per kilowatt hour, and I found stats for the um, Tesla X around about 6.3. So what I'm going to do is say that a 10 kilowatt hour battery is 6 times 10 is 60 kilograms, and what that means is that the battery is 70 times less energy dense than diesel and that's our first data point. Okay so let's take the electric and uh, diesel F-150s then. We're going to take the extended range version here because that's the long one, the 131 kilowatt hour, and we've got 98 litres of diesel in the diesel version, which is in energy terms equivalent to 980 kilowatt hours or thereabouts. That's 750% more energy, so it seems like the 
uh, electric vehicle is just dead in the water. But there's more to it than that because the electric vehicle is probably going to be 85% efficient now. Estimates vary from 80 to 95 percent. I'm just going to run with 85 percent, and that means that of its 131 kilowatt hours of energy, around 111 actually go towards propelling the vehicle. Now, the story is very different for the diesel because that's only about 20 percent efficient. Again, that's just an average of figures I've read. So that means we've actually only got 196 kilowatts of energy propelling the vehicle, and that's a difference of still significant, but 76 percent. Now. Another point here is that that battery I'm estimating used on those weights that I came up with earlier weighs around 786 kilograms, which is over a quarter of the vehicle's weight. And if I want another 111 kilowatts um, of per kilowatt hours of propulsion, that's another over three quarters of a ton. That's heavy. Now, the diesel here only weighs 83 kilograms, and if I want to take another 196 kilowatt hours effective energy, well, that's only going to be another 83 um, kilograms, and obviously that gets lighter as, as I use it. So for extended range stuff, you can see the electric vehicle is at a disadvantage, and it gets worse when you try and add more um, more energy. So that's my second issue with it. Payload is really important for us tourists. We, we need to take a lot of stuff, a lot of food, a lot of water, people, etc. We're to pack those vehicles. An electric vehicle is using a lot of its, of its, in effect, carrying capacity for the battery before you start putting everything else in because they're proportionately heavy. And increasing the range of an EV is difficult because you can't realistically take extra jerry cans of electricity. They're just too big and bulky and heavy. It just simply doesn't really work. Whereas you can do that with a petrol or diesel vehicle. All right, now let's talk about aerodynamics because this is interesting to see why the range is the way it is. So we've got three oblongs here and something there's something called a CD or coefficient of drag and that's basically how much drag a given object produces when it moves through the air. And what I've done here is beautifully, you must admit, draw some lines of air coming through here and it go around the back and they can't follow the contours of this oblong so they sort of end up in this turbulent air at the back. We take the same um, and we call that a drag coefficient of one. Um, we put a circle around it here, and then again, we get separation at the back, but not quite as much, and then that halves the drag to about 0.5. And we put a streamlined shape around it here, and you can see that the air um, actually meets nicely at the back, it doesn't break away, and the drag coefficient on that is around about 0.1, or about a tenth. So that's how important um, drag is. Now once you get a car above maybe 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour, the major force holding it back is drag, which is why EVs are so drag efficient. So here we've got the electric F-150, here's the diesel, and I don't know for sure, but what I've read and um, guesstimated is that the drag coefficient on this is about 0.3, and this one is about 0.5, so that's significant significant at cruising speeds. And you can see why. First thing is the grill. Um, the electric F-150 has no need of a radiator or anything else like that, so it can close off its grill, whereas the diesel must take air inside its radiator, and that generates quite a lot of drag. So there's, there's an advantage to the F-150 already. We look at these wheels. They're fairly um, smooth there, whereas these wheels here are not so smooth, they'll generate more drag. And if you look at a Tesla, you'll see that a Tesla's wheels are shaped like that, shaped like this rider, just to reduce the drag. Okay, so basically EVs are designed to be super aerodynamically efficient to compensate for the fact that they don't have very much energy. And that's important to bear in mind for what us towers and four-wheel drivers do. Now this is the aerodynamic equation for drag, which we are actually not going to use. We're going to use a simplified version of that, which does the same concept. We're going to take the F-150 electric, and we're going to say it's got. A, we're going to assume it's got that 0.3 CD and an area, frontal area of four square meters, multiply one by the other. We're just going to come up in our simplified version of 0.8 drag units, and here we're going to take 0.45 by the same area. We're going to come up with 1.2 drag units. Now we're going to put a caravan on the back, and that caravan, we're going to call it a drag coefficient of 0.8, because it's pretty much like a square, um, and we'd, it's six square meters, and we're going to call that 4.8 drag units. So what that gives us is the 0.8 drag units here, um, plus the 4.8 here, is 5.6, or we're increasing the drag by seven times with the electric vehicle. Now we do the same for the ICE vehicle, 1.2 plus 4.8 equals 6, that's five times more drag. Now you can see the difference, that's seven times, that's five times more drag, um, and if we go to 
a typical four-wheel drive, everything on this creates drag. We've got um, taller tires, we've got a ball bar, we've got lights, we've got a roof rack, we've got a snorkel, we've got antennas. Everything about this car increases drag, which is critical. So here's the issue. Because EVs are very aerodynamically efficient to begin with, they are proportionately more greatly affected by extra draggy stuff like modifications and um, caravans and, and trailers than the equivalent ICE vehicle. That is the problem. So their range is disproportionately reduced when a trailer is towed or the car is modified. And you can kind of think of it like this Unimog and a trailer. So what difference would the trailer make to the Unimog's fuel consumption? Absolutely nothing. It's, it's just, you know, probably irrespective. But if you took that same trailer and towed it behind a tiny smart car, well, you know, it would have a much greater proportional um, effect. So that's the aerodynamic problem. So let's take a look at some real world tow tests. So this is out of spec reviews. They've got a Rivian R1T. It's towing a trailer weighed to 1500 kilos. It weighs about 700 unladen. Then they got rid of those sandbag weights and they put this aerodynamic drag device in and they found that the, tra the lighter trailer, but draggier trailer, used 42% more energy than the heavier trailer. Um, so basically aero is more of an effect but also interestingly 75 kilowatt hours um, used out of about 135 hour kilowatt battery versus 53 so that really does deplete your range significantly. Then Cars Guy did this test of a Model X versus the 200 series with the um, Tesla Model X, 93% greater energy consumption, with the LC200, 61% greater consumption, so significantly less, and of course the 200 series had a lot greater range to begin with. I've done something similar myself, towing a uh, Tesla, and I found an equally dramatic drop in range. Then we've got TFL, who've done a cross-country tow with an R1T, Rivian again, um, 4,300 kilometres. They stopped 28 times, which is about once every 100 miles or 160 kilometres. Inside EVs had another Rivian, they put it into tow mode and instantly their range dropped by half. So, how does this translate into um, an example? Well, let's work through it. So, how quickly can you charge an EV battery? Well, this is Mercedes website, um, EQC, 80 kilowatt hour battery, which is only going to be on the small side for a four-wheel drive doing any form of towing, but we'll run with that. For a DC fast charger, this is best case, 0.4 hours and one hour to go from naught to 100%, but typically you only go to 80%. Now this 80% is important. Every EV manufacturers are only go to 80%. The reason is it's quicker to charge, also it's good for battery life, but for four-wheel driving and towing, you don't want to go off with three quarters of a tank or so of fuel, but so therefore you don't want to charge your battery only to 80%. You want to charge to 100 for maximum range. I go into the bush, I want as much fuel as I can take because you never know what's going to happen. All right, so here's a towing trip which I've actually done going from Melbourne to um, Lithgow and we're called at 900 kilometers. I'm going to compare EV versus ICE. So with the ICE we'll take the um, diesel F-150 for this, 1000 kilometer range as we calculated before. Uh, I'm going to take 40% as an impact on, on that range and that is going to give me a new range. I'm going to add 10% to that for a reserve. 540 kilometers is what I can uh, tow for. The trip's 900, so I've only got to stop once to refuel my car and I'm going to stop for half an hour. You can obviously add more extra um, stopping times and uh, resting times. That gives me charge time or refuel time half an hour, driving time 10 hours, total 10 and a half hours. If I take the F-150 Lightning extended range, range of 483 kilometers to begin with, I'm going to cut that by 50% so greater and the reason I do that is for the um, explanations beforehand, how much air, air effects etc. Gives us a range of 217 including that 10% reserve. I'm going to have to stop four times. I'm going to work on 1.2 hours to charge from very little to quite a lot based on that um, EQC battery and other stuff that I've read. 
So that means you're going to be charging for 4.8 hours, driving for 10, 15 hour trip. If I go to 80% charge, then my range is 385 kilometers um, to begin with, but by the time I've made the calculations, it's down to 174, which is really not very much. I'm going to stop five times, but because my charge time is going to be cut down to let's say three quarters of an hour, I actually finished the trip in 14 hours, which is still slow, but quicker. All right, so this is what it looks like as one option. Now, here's the hours from 0 to 2 up to 16. Um, in the ICE vehicle, I can drive and I've got to stop somewhere in here if I want to um, what, what, what one stop the trip. I'm going to stop for half an hour, then I continue. So that green is my driving time, orange is stopped time. Now, with the EV, I've got to drive here, then I'm going to recharge, drive, recharge, drive, recharge, etc., etc. So I've got a lot more stop time in there. And what um, concerns me about this is that when I'm on a long distance trip, I want to stop when I, the human, needs to stop as opposed to when the mechanical vehicle needs to stop. Because what if I don't want to take a break? Well, and there's, I've got to charge the car anyway. Or what if I do want to take a break and you know what, there's no charger around. I, I, I want that flexibility. And I don't typically want to pull over my EV by the side of the road and not charge it whilst I need to take a break. Anytime I'm stopped with an EV, I want to be with a charger, unlike with an, with an ICE vehicle, it's not so important. With the 80%, um, we've got to drive and then we'll recharge and it actually ends up quicker, which is why you often charge only to 80% when you're doing EV road trips. That last 20% takes a long time, but there's, but there's more stops. So but again, you're, you're cutting into your flexibility. All right, so here's something called ABRP or A Better Route Plan. It's a really good EV charging um, t planning tool. And I'm going to do the trip again from Melbourne um, up to Lithgow and we're going to start with 100% SOC, so the charge on departure. We're going to aim for 10% on arrival. And stock standard, we only need to do two charges for 1.5 hours. And you know, that's not too bad. Stopping 27 minutes there, yep, um, that's probably doable. I wouldn't really want to stop for an hour up there or close to it, but you know, it's not the end of the world. But that is stock standard with no modifications, no load, no trailer. Now, if we halve that, and again, taking 50% off, it looks quite different. So now we have to do five charges totaling four hours, which is pretty much what I'd calculated before. So ABRP came to the same sort of thing. This orange part here and here, that's saying, well, you can't drive to the speed limit. You've, you've got to back off. You've got to conserve power over here. And you can see we've got 44 minutes, 53. It's, it's a lot of waiting there. And we've got to go this direction here in order to get to a charger. So some of this is the fact that there aren't DC charges all the way along the route. But look, this is a fairly main route there. Um, and, you know, if we're going up for Swan Hill, Broken Hill or something like that, you know, we can pretty much forget about DC fast charges there for a while, I expect. So that kind of shows just how difficult it is to tow at high speed with an EV across uh, long country. Okay, so EV range issue number five, starting at 100% and finishing at naught isn't practical for what we do because you may not be able to start at 100% uh, to begin with. And when you get to your destination, often you want to drive around and not wait for hour two, whatever else, maybe more to, to recharge the vehicle. And then also number six, recharging just takes a long time. And you know, if you're gonna do one charge, then that's maybe okay. But if you need to do multiple charges in the course of a day, that really adds up. And that means you can't complete your trip or you're gonna run into fatigue problems or whatever else. So let's talk about the Simpson Desert Crossing. Now that is 500 kilometers from Mount Dare to Birdsville, uh, mostly of sand dunes. And that's actually beyond the range of the F-150 or the Rivian, even uh, if it was bitumen, unloaded, completely stock standard, but it won't be. You have your tyres down, you'll be going through sand, you'll be heavily loaded, it will be often quite hot, so the air conditioner will be going, Things, the battery will need to use some of its energy to cool itself, etc., etc. We're just not going to do it. And also, you're not going to get any regen descending sand dunes because sand is soft and you're actually going to need to drive down. So um, no EV is going to be able to do that trip for quite a while, I would imagine. So let's take a look at a Victorian high country trip and this one's 160 kilometers worth of driving from here to and about there and this would be what an ice vehicle would require low range for it would be steep hills uh, rocks ruts muds um, that sort of thing uh, river crossings now the 160 kilometers should be within 
easy range of an EV, maybe four or 500 kilometers of range standard. So I think that would be okay, but that assumes you can actually charge it to 100% here easily. And again, Outback Town is not necessarily the case. It also assumes you're happy getting here um, fairly low as well, because the 160, once you loaded the vehicle up with people and luggage and camping gear and whatever else, you know, um, you're going to deplete your range pretty quickly as you would indeed for any vehicle. So if I was to do this trip in an EV, I'd leave Melbourne early in the morning. Um, I'd probably come here. I don't really want to spend an hour plus two hours, whatever else charging here, and then another whatever hours charging here before I can get home. So again, for extended forest trips, really don't think EVs can cut it. For a day trip, I think they could absolutely could do that. It was just in and out in a day and it's fairly close to a DC charger at the start and finish. All right, so summarise then, four points. EV range is absolutely fine for cities and suburbs. That's no problem whatsoever. And it's doable for interstate. You, you can certainly drive interstate, certainly along the main routes, at hardly any slower than a ice vehicle would be able to do it. Um, and I think it's actually okay for short off-road trips as well. You know, you go out to your local state forest, you come back, um, you can charge at night, you're not camping, looking to make an early start next day with a lot of range, etc. But for off-road touring and towing, the sort of stuff I've talked about in this video, we need three big improvements. Number one, we need energy density to massively improve, which is the amount of energy, electrical energy, per kilogram of battery. That's got to way improve. We can't have three quarters of a ton battery. We need energy replenishment speed to improve massively. So we can't wait an hour, two hours to even a DC fast charge. It's going to be slower if, if it's not one of the best charges out there. And we need more charge points. That would also help solve the problem as well. So they just need to be really commonplace, probably even more commonplace than petrol stations at the moment. But remember, EVs are in their infancy, and particularly four-wheel drive EVs. So this is only going to get better. Could hydrogen be um, part of the answer? Don't know, but maybe just battery technology will get better. Regardless, I hope you found this video interesting. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments, and thanks for watching.